vehicle. Tell me about your vehicle, who you are, and why you're here. Please. Uh, my name is Bob Bittner. I'm the test lead on the project, and this is Carnegie Mellon's 2007 Chevy Tahoe named Boss. Uh, it works off of uh, radar, GPS, and lasers. Uh, makes smart decisions about the world around it and uh, makes its way down the road to where it needs to get to. Okay, how did you do in the Urban Challenge? Uh, we were the victors. Excellent. By how much of a margin? Uh, it was a 20 minute margin. Very good. Great. And that, when was that? 2007? That was November 3rd, 2007. And what else will you use this vehicle for in the future? Uh, the Before initial events. application was from DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. They'd like to see uh, pull, pull people out of the convoys. Uh, especially overseas, uh, to take uh, keep them safe. Here, though, what you see is a lot of the subsets of the technology pulled out and introduced into the vehicles that we're driving every day. Uh, you'll end up with a lot of uh, early warning for accidents, uh, it, be able to monitor uh, the world around it, what's going on, be able to tell us about lane departure and uh, accident avoidance, obstacle avoidance, it's defensive driving. And that's starting to get into cars right now these days on high-end cars a little bit. We've seen a little bit of some of those items. Right, right, right. And I think that's the way it'll be introduced into society so that uh, they can accept it. Right now, I don't think people are ready to see a car just driving itself down the road. Okay. Um, some, some statistics on this. Uh, how much did it cost? How long did it take to build? How much does it weigh? Performance? Uh, we didn't really add that much weight to it. I believe the uh, gross weight is around 6,000 pounds. It's weight enough to start with. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it, it, well, it, it, it works very, very well. Obviously, it works very well. Um, the project itself, from when we received the vehicle, was 14 months until the race. So it, it was a very tight timeline. And uh, that's uh, one of the reasons that we have the, the sensors on the vehicle the way it is. Uh, what we did was we put a common platform on the top and we ran through a lot of sensors to see which ones worked, which ones didn't. And uh, so we didn't spend uh, a lot of time integrating in them flush into the vehicle. We just figured out what it was that worked and made ourselves as ready for the race as we could be. Okay, how many people worked on it? Uh, we had a, a core team out of uh, Carnegie Mellon, uh, their part racing team. We also had embedded engineers from General Motors, Caterpillar, Continental, and Intel. How many students worked on it? Uh, off the top of my head, I, I really don't know. There were a lot of students involved. Um, same with faculty and staff. How many of them got C minuses on the project? Uh, probably not too many. <laughs> They're all the right kids, I imagine. Very good. And um, what performance was uh, can you get out of it in terms of top speed, where it's it's capable of running, or average speed, or uh, the challenge? We were told that during the challenge, the maximum speed would be 30 miles an hour. So that two vehicles coming at each other at 60 mile an hour closing speed it, it's actually pretty significant. Um, all of the, uh, the, the software and the sensors were designed to react to a safe operating speed of 30 miles per hour. Okay, but on the side, how fast have you guys taken this just for fun or for your own testing? I can neither confirm nor <laughs> deny. The, <laughs> pretty we, fast. Yeah. No, actually we, we've uh, pretty much just done 30 miles an hour. Okay. It's, there, we've had no reason to take it higher than that. Sure. Yeah. Yet. After it's lived its purpose, maybe you'll have a little fun with it then. Um, why'd you go with such an, enorm an enormous vehicle? Is this full to the roof with electronics in there? Well, there's. Uh, it's, it's actually a very uh, versatile vehicle. It, it has a fantastic turning radius. It has all the uh, space that we would need inside. What we do is we keep, a lot of times, uh, four people inside of this uh, for development work. We've installed a uh, small table in between with little cup holders and outlets and uh, act uh, Ethernet access back to the computers, but the uh, it's comfortable for the developers. They actually spend a lot of time in the vehicle uh, with their laptops or software, and they can uh, get an actual feel for how the software is affecting the final product. See so those guys have a big red panic button in front of them to stop if there's something bad happening. Uh, there are several panic buttons around the vehicle, and the, uh, we've got four mounted on the roof and one inside. Okay. Can you tell me briefly what each of these subsystems are and what they do without uh, getting too super detailed? Sure, we've got uh, three GPS antennas mounted on top and we uh, we use three uh, without getting too much detail so that we can get a very good fix on where we're at and we can also orient ourselves where we're at. Uh, in the back here we've got a couple of uh, close range uh, radars, these are big comms and some long range radar. 
And we've also got a planar LIDAR back here. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a laser that shoots out in a plane. Up on top of the vehicle back here, we have a, uh, it's called a Velodyne, and that will actually spin, and it's got 64 lasers in it that uh, spins at 10 hertz and produces about a million bits of data a second. It's, it's a very, uh, very useful tool to have. Also up on the front, we have uh, more radars and LIDARs, both short and long range. And, uh, we, on the sides here, we have the pan heads. Uh, you see the small units that are sticking down from the framework up there. Uh, when you come up to an intersection, typically you'll look left and look right to see when it's safe. These will actually pan out and search for where traffic would be coming from uh, off of the roadways and uh, decide when it be able to track the vehicles that are coming in and decide when it's safe to come out and merge into traffic. I think those should be standard on California drivers. That would be really nice. <laughs> don't seem to look at that. Even just that alone to let people know that they're about to pull out into an yeah, unsafe yeah. situation would be a really nice thing. That would be awesome. That'd be great. Um, what else can you tell me? Give a, a dollar figure. How much you spent on this? I don't. <laughs> it's a lot. Yes, it is. The, uh, the prize for the, uh, winning the challenge was $2 million. And we're very happy to receive that. And that went somewhat towards me. <laughs> we're very happy to receive that. Very good. <laughs> Excellent. What's um, what's nice? You know, Carnegie Mellon obviously is a huge robotics presence, huge robotics department. Um, will there be continuing vehicles next year, each year? As students will build a new project. What's what's in the future? Uh, we'll be uh, obviously pursuing the technology in, in many different ways. Um, we're in the process of working up different projects right now. Okay, I understand that a lot of these DARPA challenge vehicles. Now that DARPA has seen that. These problems can be tackled. A lot of this technology is moving to the private sector to refine, to shrink these down, to fit them into the bumpers, make them visible. So, is that taking the fun away from the students who are going to do projects next year? Uh, no, I, I, well, that part of it is, is not there anymore, which is true. DARPA's intent was to direct the technology to make, uh, to, to make it capable to have driverless vehicles. They're satisfied with uh, the direction that the technology is headed right now. So we don't expect to see any more of this type of challenges coming out of DARPA. But what it has done is excited the community, generated an interest in uh, vehicle safety and uh, autonomous driving and all the benefits that can come from this technology bringing it out into society. And every year, 42,000 people a year die in the U.S. in auto accidents. Pulling out some subsets of this technology and getting it out into the marketplace, we've, we've been working with General Motors, and they're very excited about this, to be able to save lives and uh, enhance the whole driving experience and make it safer. Great. Now, you mentioned that a lot of these systems are modular here and not very integrated in the car. Can you unbolt all these items and put them on a different car and run that car? Right, autonomously? and that's that's some of the projects that, that are out there also. Now that we know what the requirements are, what it takes to be able to travel at, at these speeds in the city and, and what types of resolution and uh, being able to track speeds, at, uh, track vehicles at what speeds and distances, we have an idea of what's required now. So that the sensors can be developed for that okay. purpose. When you're going to run this vehicle on a certain course, how much knowledge of the course do you need beforehand to program into it? Or can you just plop it down anywhere and it'll drive great anywhere? Uh, it's it's a combination of both. Uh, we, we do need to be given or to create a route network. So we can do that through a satellite image, through uh, uh, what they call a geotip that's available from the government on the web, or. Uh, we can actually just drive it and record the waypoints and create the, the roadway that that way. Um, the more information we have, the better, but it's this machine is very versatile and very robust. It's capable of figuring out where the road is. Uh, part of the challenge that uh, DARPA had laid out was uh, sparse waypoints, and what they did was they, they basically said, here's the beginning, and gave you a couple points, a few points in between, and then they cut a dirt road. Uh, down through over a hill and you had to be able to figure out where the actual road existed and make your way down through. Okay, so you were driving without prior knowledge in certain parts of the competition. Uh, exactly, right. Today, are you going to let it drive itself to the track or are you going to steer it manually to the track? We'll take it manually to the track and then we'll let it fly. How fast will you go around this two-mile course? Uh, what our, our time will be, I don't know. Uh, we're we're running with the, with the proven program that we have is 30 miles an hour. 
So each of these vehicles, that'll be the maximum speed they're allowed to hit. Okay. So we'll have to see how each one handles in the corners, I guess. But it's really not okay. here as a competition. This is a chance to show the technology, show where we are with it, and to uh, see about generating interest in the advancement. That's great. It's very impressive. Anything I didn't ask you you want to add that I missed? Uh, this is a fantastic field to be in. It's very exciting. It's growing really fast. And uh, keep an eye on it. Great. Congratulations on your win. It's a nice looking vehicle and good luck today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you describe what we're looking at? Uh, real, real quick, uh, what we've got here is uh, you've got 10 blades of Intel's dual core processors. Uh, some data logging equipment. We've got an Aplanix up here that uh, takes input from uh, GPS, uh, inertial movement, and uh, some encoders. Uh, it helps to figure out where we are sometimes when we lose GPS. We have uh, this is a remote uh, kill that will be used. Uh, well, actually, it won't, it'll be used to start the vehicle. Uh, what we'll do is we'll uh, have the vehicle in pause. We'll, we'll put it in autonomous and leave it in pause. And then when they give us the command to go, the only the only communication that we'll have with this vehicle is go ahead and run. And then we'll also have the capability of pausing it if if we think we need to. But uh, that's that's typical with any robot, especially ones that run out on under their own power and their own uh, decisions. Yeah, I recognize